Okay, so we're going to continue part two of two on this lecture, starting with isotopes. Isotopes vary um, in atomic weight from the regular element, and you can see here we have two examples, carbon-12 and carbon-14. And the reason they vary in the weight is because they vary in the number of neutrons. And so carbon-14 has eight neutrons, and carbon-12 has the regular six neutrons. Some is uh, isotopes can be unstable and change to form other elements. However, all atoms are isotopes of one form or another, and most are stable. Some of the energetic emissions giving off during isotope breakdown are called radioactivity, and they can include X-rays, gamma rays, alpha particles, which are helium nuclei, neutrons, and beta particles. So the number of atoms left at any time t is reduced from the original number by the rate of decay times time for radioactive decay. So if the half-life of a radioactive isotope is five days, then in five days it will decay to half the amount that was present in day zero. In ten days it will decay to a quarter of the original amount, um, because that's one-half times one-half. In twenty days it will decay to one-half times one-half times one-half times one-half, or one-sixteenth. So if you start with 100 radioactive atoms, after one half-life you'll have 50, two half-lives 25, and so on. That gives you a neat little radioactive decay curve, and you can actually measure the amount of time that it takes by looking at the curve. So you can determine the half-life by looking at the graph, and in this case the half-life of strontium-90 is 25 years. There are some practical uses for isotopes. Uh, molecules containing different isotopes are not metabolized differently from each other. So a carbon-12 will get metabolized the same way a carbon-14 would, for example. So thus the molecules containing radioactive isotopes can be made and used to trace movements of those molecules in an organism or in its cells. Radioactive isotopes are used to diagnose and treat disease, and they can be used to date fossils. The ratio of the radioactive isotopes and absorbed nutrients is constant in the environment, and certain isotopes selectively decay, so the ancient materials have a changed isotopic ratio from those of the current present-day organisms. Now a difference between isotopes and this one that I'm going to talk about, ions, is that we're not differing the number of neutrons, we're differing the number of electrons. The net charge of an atom is usually zero because the number of electrons is usually equal to the number of protons. If the number of electrons does not equal the number of protons, the atom is called an ion. Ions have a net charge. The charge is dependent on the number of electrons. So if the number of electrons is greater than the number of protons, then the ion is negative, and it's called an anion. If the number of protons is greater than the number of electrons, then the ion is positive, and it's called a cation. The magnitude of the charge is dependent upon the difference in the number of electrons and protons. For example, if an atom contains seven electrons and five protons, the net charge is negative two. When we start to combine atoms, you have to understand that atoms really only react when they come very close to one another, and this is called the collision theory. Atoms can stick together and form molecules, which are combinations of atoms or they can just bounce off, depending on charge and a whole bunch of other factors. If the molecule is formed from more than one element, in other words, from different kinds of atoms, we call the resulting molecule a compound. The molecular weights are merely the sum of the atomic weights of the composing elements. So NaCl, which is table salt, um, or sodium chloride, has a molecular weight of 58 because it contains one sodium uh, atom and one chlorine ab atom. Sodium weighs 23 atomic units, while chlorine weighs 35. Chemical formulas describe the composition and or organization of molecules. The simplest formula, also called the empirical formula, is the smallest whole number ratio of atoms per molecule. The subscripts indicate the number of atoms. So if you take a look at this glucose molecule here, you can see that the simplest formula is CH2O because that's the ratio of the atoms to each other. The molecular formula indicates the actual number, not the ratio of the atoms in the molecule. So in this case, glucose is C6H12O6. This is one of the 
few chemical formulas you do actually need to know in biology. Glucose is kind of what makes the world go round, so you do need to know that one. And finally, the structural formula shows the actual number of atoms as well as their connectivity. In other words, which one's connected to which one. Um, and so you can see here the structural formula of glucose, which is actually called cis-glucose. There's another one called trans-glucose, and it gets a little complicated in organic chemistry. You don't need to worry about that part. Just be able to recognize this little hexagonal structure of glucose. Atoms stick together by linkages we call bonds. All biological reactions in involves some sort of reorganization of bonds. Bond reorganization, which is the breakage or building of bonds, results in the uptake or release of energy. Bond energy is the energy needed to break a given bond or to form it. Covalent bonds are what commonly occurs in biology. Almost all biological compounds, organic compounds, are covalently bonded. It's kind of the nature of the beast with those guys because they're all nonmetals sticking together. Um, the outer shells of both of the atoms become filled, but be they become filled because they share their electrons. And so it kind of is, you know, it's like a co-op or a commune. Uh, more than one bond can occur between two atoms, um, up to three. Uh, so those are pretty much where we go. When we think about covalent bonds, we think about it in a couple of different ways. The Lewis structure uses dots to indicate the number of valence electrons in the shells of the atoms, the outer shells of the atoms. So remember, the valence electrons are the ones that actually do the work. They help the atoms combine together. In contrast, a structural model just uses a line to represent a shared pair of electrons. So if you see two lines, that means they're sharing two pairs. If there's one line, they're sharing one par pair, and if there's three, they're sharing three pairs. So again, organic molecules are covalently bonded, but there are other kinds of bonds that are important in biology, and most of those are ionic bonds. Ionic bonds happen because one atom loses an electron and the other atom takes it, or more than one. An electronegative atom, remember I said, the electronegatives steal the electrons from another atom to fill its valence shell because they want to have a full valence shell. So, in other words, one or more electrons leave one atom center to live with another, and they become ions. Both of them become ions, and so it's called an ionic bond. An example of ionic bonding is sodium chloride. When we put it in water, it breaks up into its component parts into the sodium ion, which is a cation, remember it's positively charged, and the chloride ion, ion which is a, an anion. When they are in its solid form, they are in a crystal lattice. But once they get into water, water splits it up and dissolves it. And you can see that happening here. Water can easily dissolve the salts because it forms these hydration shells around the ions. Water becomes a solvent, and it's considered the universal solvent, although it doesn't work in every case. And salt is considered the solute. Because of those hydration shells, the ions can't see each other anymore, so they can't form those, reform those ionic bonds. Remember, in order to dissolve in water, it has to be similar to water. So the solutes have to be either polar or ionic, and you'll hear about polar uh, nature of water in a later lecture. In polar covalent bonds, this is a little different because you, you look at things like water, and it's caused by a partial positive and a partial negative charge. Even though there's not really a covalent bond, there's not really a sharing. Um, there is, but there isn't. And the reason there is, but there isn't, is that it's unequal. Because for things like water, the electronegative oxygen pulls those electrons from the hydrogen. And so the electrons tend to hang out more over by the oxygen than they do over by the hydrogen. So the oxygen gets a partial negative charge and the hydrogens get a partial positive charge. And so water is a common um, polar covalent bond and that can result, that partial negative and positive charge results in hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen is required, hence the name, and an electronegative atom must be covalently bonded to the hydrogen, in this case oxygen. 
The electronegative atom incompletely pulls the electrons away from the hydrogen nucleus and they become displaced but not removed from the oxygen, so it's not an ionic bond. Examples of such electronegative atoms are oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. Please note that all of these elements are needed to fill their valence shell, and please see the periodic table. And finally, there are weak forces called van der Waals forces. These are short-lived charges on the surface of molecules that induce opposite charges in adjacent molecules. And so they, pro they kind of form a temporary bond, but not really. Um, they become more important in enzyme bonding and in DNA, and we'll talk more about that later. Okay, this concludes part two of two, of lecture two, and uh, hope you have a great day. We'll see you back next time when we talk about properties of water.